So turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Last year, uh, the week of the 4th of July, I was preaching at a church in Eden, New York, not far from Niagara Falls. And uh, I preached on, I spoke on this passage here in Matthew 9, and the pastor told me, he says, every missionary under the sun preaches on Matthew 9. He says, you know, you don't need to preach on Matthew 9. There's other portions of the scripture that speak on, uh, that, that talk about these things. But I'd like to focus on one particular word here that is found in these passages. And uh, maybe we can study this a little bit. And I, I hope that you will take this, take this home with you, uh, especially with your families. And, um, you know, let, 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 me just, let me just back up before we, before we read scripture here. And let me share a little bit of, uh, 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 of a story. Um, we need people to serve the Lord, right? How do you find them? When I was in college, I discovered that me and several of my classmates... We all shared a similar uh, story in regards to our church, in in, in the church that we were from. And it went something like this, and I'll share my story. I grew up in a, you know, godly, Bible-believing churches, and I had a youth group. There were many good, godly teenagers in that youth group, or so I thought. But uh, of that youth group, let's just say there were, I had 20 friends uh, as a teenager, that I was in pretty close contact with. And of those 20 people, less than half of them are in church today. And of those half that are still in church, I'm the only young man. No, I take it back. Now, I, I'm one of two young men in that youth group that pursued ministry, serving the Lord in ministry. The other eight... They might be in church today, but they're really not actively serving the Lord. And the other half aren't in church at all. When I was in college, we realized, me and my my roommates and other classmates, we realized that many of the people that we had graduated with in high school, those young people were not interested in serving the Lord. They were in the process of leaving church. Those young people went off to secular colleges looking to get involved in a career that would enable them to make lots of money But they weren't interested in going to church. And it wasn't just me that had this story. My roommates had this story. And then there were several other classmates that we met that had this story. They were the only one, or if not, if there there was another, it was just one or two of them of their whole graduating class that was focused on serving the Lord. Now that's, that is, that is heartbreaking. And unfortunately, we are losing the younger generation to the lust of the world, to the love of money. Love of God is something that's talked about, but it's not actually done. A lot of young people, they question God's word. They question, well, what if? They look for the exception to the rule and not the rule itself. You know, I, in fact, I have spoken, I've had conversations with young people, and I've never had a young person say this to me. But this attitude becomes so prevalent as we've had this conversation that it really gets under my skin. And the attitude is this. Adam, you want to be a pastor, so you need to do what is right. But I want to pursue this career, so I don't need to do what's right. That's a very, very ungodly attitude, and it will only lead down the slippery slope of sin. Uh, there's a lot of young people that maybe they won't, will not say what I just said, but that's what they're doing. Here, in Matthew chapter 9, begin reading in verse number 37. The Lord Jesus, he saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. 
Our Father, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would use it in all of our hearts. And I pray that you would raise up laborers from this body of people here this morning to go out into this world and to accomplish your work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's all kinds of truth here in this passage. We can talk about the need to reach uh, the multitudes. We can talk about the fact that Jesus had compassion on these multitudes. We can talk about the great need of the harvest. But, I, but I, the, the main thrust of this verse here is that we need more laborers. I met a gentleman about six months ago, and this gentleman was involved in missionary radio ministry. He starts radio ministries all over the world. He's been in the Philippines, he's been in South America, he's been in several countries in Africa. He's even helped start some radio stations that can reach into the, into the Muslim countries of the 1040 window. He's met missionaries all over the world. And this is what he told me. He says, Adam, the missionary problem that we're dealing with today is not a harvest problem. The harvest is there. And we can reach people. All right? He says, so it's not a harvest problem. And he says, it's not even a financial problem. He says, missionaries, they need f- monthly financial support. But that is not the greatest need that missionaries have right now. He says, the greatest need that missionaries have right now is laborers. You look at a lot of missionaries that are out there, there's a lot of older missionaries. And you look at the billions of people that need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there are not enough missionaries out there to reach them. What is the problem? Well, the harvest is a little bit of a problem. I mean, it is difficult to reach that harvest. Money can be, a, can be a little bit of a problem. You do need finances to buy gospel tracts, to start new churches. I mean, the, the laborer is worthy of his hire, and that is also true in ministry. But the main problem here that the Lord sees is that there's a laborer problem. We need more laborers to do the work. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He will finance his work. In fact, let me just back up and talk about our own church plant there's a hundred reasons why we should not start a church this year. Uh, and all of them physical. But God's going to provide the finances for a church to get started. And I can think of 50,000 spiritual reasons to start a church. Because there's 50,000 lost people up in the Hamburg area that need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they may not live till next year. If you listen to our government, the coronavirus may kill them off. So that this year is the year to start, to start a church that people can get saved. So... We need to find laborers. How do you find laborers? I'd like to present three simple ways for you to find laborers. And let me also uh, change one of those words. Three simple ways to raise up laborers. Because one of the places where we can find laborers for God's work is right in our own homes, in our own families. But the first way that you can find a laborer for God's purpose is to beg God for laborers. There are three words used in the New Testament that refer to prayer. Okay? Then these are three they're, they're, found, they're, they're found in the Greek language, but they're all they're all translated pray, pray or prayer in our New Testament. In Luke eleven, one and two, there was a disciple who went up to the Lord Jesus and he said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then the Lord Jesus said, when ye pray, and he proceeded to give what we call the Lord's Prayer. That word, the Greek word for that is prosukomai, and that is a very generic term for pray. It is found, it is very common throughout the New Testament, and most of the time when you find <coughs> the, uh, the word pray or prayer used in the New Testament, the Greek word behind that English word is this generic term, prosukomai. The second Greek word is is the word erotao. And let's turn over and uh, and look at an example of this. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 15. We're already there in Matthew, so let's turn over to Matthew chapter 15. And 
And uh, in verse 23... Uh, the Bible says, uh, this is talk with the, when there was a woman, the Canaanite woman, who had a daughter vexed with the devil. And his, and, but he answered her, this Canaanite woman, not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. The, the Greek word eratao, it means to ask, it means to, to beseech, it means to make an important request. So it has a little greater strength behind it than to simply pray. But here in Matthew chapter 9, we find a third word given for the word pray. Okay. Prosukumai is a very generic term for pray. Eratao is a slightly stronger word to ask for something important. But in Matthew chapter 9, the Greek word is deomai. And this word means to beg for something. It means to literally beg. You're not just praying. You're not just asking for something important. You are begging God for something very, very important. Let's look at an example of this over in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. I love it when the Bible gives illustrations of, uh, of its own. Uh, it basically gives a commentary on its, own, on, on its own words. Luke chapter 8 and verse number 28. All right, now this here is talking about the, uh, the maniac of a Gadara who was, um, who was indwelt with two, over 2,000 devils. Now this is, these are the demons speaking in this verse. In Luke 8, 28, it says, When he, this, this maniac, filled with 2,000 devils, he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell before Jesus, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I beseech thee, torment me not. Now these devils, they know the power of Jesus. They understand his power, having witnessed it for the past, well, at this point, it would have been around 4,000 years. They have seen God do some very, very powerful things, and they feared the presence of Jesus. So what did they do? They, uh, it, it, it says that they fell down before Jesus, and they were begging him, spare us. Do not, please, do not torment us. Now, this same word, uh, deomai, means to beg. It is also used in verse 38. This time it's not used of the devils. It's used of the maniac after the devils have been cast out of him. In verse 38 it says, Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. You know, that man, God had worked a tremendous miracle in that man's life. And that man was saying, this guy, this Jesus, he, he is the Christ, and I need him. I need him, his protection from those devils. I need him in my life to, because he is the only one who can truly save me. And he was begging Jesus Christ, let me go with you. Let me go with you. Let me go with you. Of course, the Lord Jesus turned down his request, but... The word, the illustration of that Greek word remains. He was begging Jesus for something of the utmost importance. When was the last time we obeyed Matthew 9, 38 and literally begged God to raise up a laborer? to bring up someone who can be a missionary to people who have never heard the name of Jesus before. Someone who can be a soul winner to go out into the highways and byways of Wilmington, Delaware and reach people for Jesus Christ. This is not a casual prayer here that Jesus is talking about. It's not something, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this food that we're about to eat, and we ask that you would raise up some laborers to reach 
uh, are of the state of Delaware. In Jesus' name, amen. And that is not the prayer that Jesus Christ is referring to. That is not the attitude that Jesus Christ is referring to. In this verse, Matthew 9, 38, he is talking about a very intense prayer where we see the seriousness of the situation. We see the multitudes of people out there who need to get saved. And there are multitudes of people who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is only a very tiny handful of missionaries and church planters working to start new churches that can reach these multitudes of people. What do we need? Those missionaries and church planters, they need more help. The first way you can find laborers for God's service is to beg God for laborers. Now the second way you can find laborers for the work of the Lord is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I believe that this here passage, this chapter in Deuteronomy is one of the most classic chapters of child raising uh, in the whole Bible. But in Deuteronomy chapter 6, there's, uh, there's several things. There's a multitude of wealth here. But in verses 4 and 5, there are two very important truths. That if people just, if we just got these two truths, it would make a profound influence, impact in our lives. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love that one Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk about them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hands, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things. Doesn't this sound like the United States of America? Houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, and vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. The two key principles here that God wants to be taught and instructed to our children is that kids, listen up kids, there's only one God. Okay? The God of the Muslims is not God. The God of the Hindus is not God. Mary, the Virgin Mary, is not God. There's only one God, and that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. And the second thing is we're supposed to love that God with everything we have. All our heart, soul, mind, and body. There's only one God, and we're supposed to love that one God. We're supposed to teach this principle, or these two principles, to our children. Now, if children truly understood that, then they would, want, they would grow up obeying and serving that God throughout their entire adult life. If teenagers truly grasped that concept, they would want to serve God with their life. But why are there so many young people growing up? Why are so many friends that I grew up with, I mean, we sat in the same church together, heard the same, we were in the same youth group together, why... Is it, uh, why am I serving the Lord and they're not? Well, either they don't understand that there's only one God, or they do not love that God. For one of those two reasons. Probably because they do not love that God. The one true God. How do we find laborers? We teach these principles to our children. Teach them about the one true God. And teach them to love God. Love God more than a career. 
love God more than, than a car. Love God more than our friends. Love God more than anything else that this life has to offer. That's what our children need to hear. I now have, a, I have one son, Daniel. He's five months old. And I remember before we were married, my wife and I, we talked about children. We talked about you know, how are we going to raise children. And I remember we went to this passage and we discussed through this passage. And we said, and we agreed and said, look, this principle right here, one Lord loving that Lord, this, is, this must be the theme of our child training. Daniel, he, 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 he can't understand yet. But as soon as he can understand, we will teach him that there is only one God. And we will teach him to love that God with everything he's got. But, number three. The first one, first way you can find laborers is to beg God for laborers. The second way you can find laborers is to raise them up in our own homes. The third way to find laborers is to be a laborer yourself. What good is it to teach something to our children if we are not willing to do it ourselves? Children will learn by your actions far greater than they will learn by your words. And your words will have much greater impact if your actions back up those words. Look here at verses 4 and 5 here. Verses 4 and 5 is not spoken to children. It is spoken to adults. It says, Hear, O Israel. God is talking to the nation here. Now, of course, children are part of the nation, but when you think of the United States of America, you, know, you mainly think of the adults who are leading this nation. Okay? God is addressing the nation of Israel, and he says, The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou, you adults, you Israelites, you leaders of the nation, you, thou, shalt love the Lord thy God with all our heart, and with all our soul, and with all thy might. And then in verse 7, it instructs us to teach these things to our children. God starts with us, the leaders and teachers of our homes. If we expect God to raise up soul winners to reach the United States of America, then God expects me to do my part. And God expects you to do your part as well. Three ways we can find laborers. We can beg God for laborers in intense prayer. We can teach our children to be laborers and raise them up with a love for God and a strong desire to be a laborer, to go out and do the work that God wants them to do. But we must also be a laborer ourselves. God is looking for laborers. And now in a church setting, there's all kinds of ways that we can serve the Lord. Someone unlocks the church door in the morning. Someone cleans the church. Someone plays the piano. Uh, so, someone pays the bills. Someone collects the offerings. Someone ha is in the nursery. Someone teaches a Sunday school class. But God is looking for every single person to be a laborer, reaching the great multitudes of the harvest and giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ.